Well, good morning. Glad to uh, see everybody today. Glad you're with us. My name is Bill Wynn. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Communion Hanover. If you're joining us on Facebook, if you're here uh, face-to-face, well, we're glad for that. Um, we believe that's the way we're supposed to, um, to gather together. And uh, we're going to begin with a prayer, as we do. So uh, if you would join me, Father in heaven, uh, you've shared love and life with the entire human race. You have um, called us to share what it is that you've had in face-to-face communion with your Son from all eternity in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you today specifically to work inside of us uh, in the places where we lack peace and um, where we will not receive it. Holy Spirit, you dwell in us and uh, from in there cry, Abba, Father, help us hear that cry, help us respond and learn to sing along and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, the title of the message today uh, is Blessed Are the Peacemakers. And that's our memory verse. We won't put it up on the screen, but it's Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God, right? So that's an easy one. That's an easy memory verse. So what does that mean? Let's just start there. What does that mean? Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Well, if we look at that with a forensic point of view, right? If we look at it in, in, in the light of uh, Greek dualism, as it were, um, we're going we're gonna to see a contract. You can, you can see almost anything you want uh, in the Bible if you, if you, if you put on a, a set of lenses that color the way we see things. Um, one of the one of the most interesting mov- movies in light of that, um, I think, was um, I forget the the title of it. American National Treasure, I think, is what it was called. It had um, all these A list actors, and they were looking for this uh, hidden treasure that was supposedly hidden by the the Knights Templar before the American Revolution. And on the back of the Declaration of Independence was supposed to be this secret message to find it. And um, they had to have these special glasses. Do you remember that? And they were different colors. And they would flip the different colors down and see that, well, we do that when we come to Scripture a lot of times. We've got this pair of glasses on, and I've got a lens for my dualism, right? This idea that I've been taught that, uh, that comes out of Greek philosophy, it's not Christian at all. It's, in fact, it's as pagan as it can be, and it's the idea that God is up there, transcendent, and that there's no way for him to have an imminent or personal experience with me or for me to have an imminent or personal experience with God because he's other. He's so transcendent, there's no way for him to have a, uh, an intimate experience with me. And so, basically, in a nutshell, it says God's up there, I'm down here, and he's angry with me because I do bad stuff, but here's a list of things that I can do to change God's mind about me. I had a a conversation with a a, a second cousin of mine one time that I hadn't seen in years, and and we were talking about this, and and she said, well, what what is Greek dualism? And so I explained it just like that. God's up there, you're down here, he's angry with you because you do bad stuff, and here's a list of things you can do to change his mind. And she goes, well, oh my gosh, that sounds like everything I ever heard in church. I said, yeah, because you didn't hear the gospel. You heard Greek philosophy blended with the gospel, right? And there's, there are, um, there are characters in Christian history that are responsible for that, And we we don't throw stones at those people, right? We eat the meat and spit out the bones. Um, There are parts of Augustine's institutes that are, they're beautiful. Even Jonathan Edwards, at the end of his life, wrote some of the most beautiful, beautiful, inclusive theology you'll ever read. You know, now his sermon during the Great Awakening, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, is not so beautiful. But later in life, in fact, if you didn't know, uh, John McLeod Campbell's book um, on the incarna- uh, on the atonement is a response to 
Jonathan Edwards specifically, where he, he argues uh, a Christus victor, Christ victorious over sin, death, and hell view of the atonement rather than uh, Jonathan Edwards' penal substitutionary atonement theory, which basically said God wants to kill somebody because things went wrong and he wants to kill you, but Jesus says, no, daddy, kill me instead. And that's absurd. That's absolutely absurd. And I've, I've been accused um, of, of um, using abusive analogies. Someone told me that once. That's an abusive analogy. And my response was, was it accurate? If it's accurate, the, it's not the analogy that's abusive. It's the idea that the, the analogy reflects that's abusive, right? So we're going to start there. We're going to start with the idea that you are God's child. You can't change that, right? Um, my kids had no say over whether they were my kids or not. Davina and I had two girls, and... Um, they, they are lovely adult young ladies now, and they, they can't change. They never could, even when they wanted to, right? I don't know if your kids ever disowned you or not, um, but it doesn't change biology, right? You can't change biology. That, that's, a, that's another longer debate in our culture today. You can't change biology just by what you think, Right? Um, Abraham Lincoln, during the, the uh, American Civil War, was walking with his advisors, and uh, there, there were, this is when Washington, D.C. still was, the outside of Washington, D.C. was still rural, and they saw sheep grazing, and um, the, the, the issue was, what do we call Africans, do we call them Citizens, do we call them humans? Do we call them men? What do we call them? And Abraham Lincoln pointed at a sheep and he said, if we say of the sheep's tail, it is a leg, how many legs will the sheep have? And apparently there was a yes man in the group, probably some young guy that was trying to advance his career and get in and be, you know, get on the, the good side of the president who had all the connections. And he said, five. And Abraham Lincoln said, no, it, it doesn't matter what we call his tail. It will always be his tail. You can't change your onto relation to the Father, Son, and Spirit. You had no say in your being brought into existence. And to a degree, neither did your parents. Your parents participated in the Father's plan for you to come into existence. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called children of God. He's not saying, unless you're a peacemaker, you can't be God's kid. He's saying, when you are a peacemaker, God the Father says, that's my girl. That's my boy. And others will say, well, that clearly, that clearly is a child of God. And the only people that might say that are the people that don't believe they are children of God. And that's one of the reasons why we want to be peacemakers, because it's an evangelical tool to be a peacemaker, right? And uh, I'm going to read from, from Romans today from the Apostle Paul. And um, in chapter 12, verse 1, and I'm going to breeze through the first part of this, and you won't see it come up on your screen until I get to verse 9. But in, in verse 1 of chapter 12, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore. So do you, you know the Bible study technique when you read Paul and you read the word therefore? What are you supposed to do? You got to back up. You got to back way up. Well, what's he talking about? Therefore. Right? So if you walked in in the middle of a conversation and said, therefore, I'm going to give everybody a hundred bucks. Well, you immediately have a question, don't you? You want to know what the therefore is. What do I have to do to get a hundred bucks? Can I get it on this hundred bucks? So Paul says, therefore, and he's talking about salvation in corporate terms with the nation of Israel and God's kindness, God's generosity to save all of mankind, right? Not just Israel. And he draws that distinction because he's writing to the church in Rome, which is a lot of Christians. And he's telling them the good news is not that, hey, it's not just for you, but don't feel left out. 
God's not only saving individuals, he's, he's got a plan for your nation. So it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For, the, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. He doesn't say, think of yourselves lowly, you know, like the, like the, um, you know, the, the, the monastics that went out in the desert and, and abused their bodies and deprived themselves of joy and pleasure and even food. No, he says, just don't think highly than you ought to think. Think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, we, and that's the difference, by the way, between equity and equality. Equality of opportunity and equity are different. Equity says, I'm going to let my hands be my feet because that's fair. I want equity. Try that. Now, I knew when I was uh, working at a summer camp when I was 21 years old uh, in, in uh, the Boundary Waters of Minnesota, I knew a guy who could do that. He could walk from our dorm he could walk from our dorm to the chow hall on his hands. And he could almost run on his hands. It's kind of creepy. But, but let, let, let you just say, hey, I, want, I want my hands to get that job. Because I want to be fair to my hands. I'm going to let my hands get that job. No. Not every part of the body has the same gift. I don't want my hands to, you know, I'm, trying, I'm rebuilding my golf swing right now from the ground up. And I don't want my hands doing my feet's job, and I don't want my feet doing my hands' job, right? I mean, my hands can't do what they're supposed to be doing right now in terms of my golf swing. I sure don't want to turn that over to my feet. They don't have opposable thumbs. He says, the gifts differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministering, the teacher to teaching, the exhorter and exhortation, man... I don't know if you've ever been around someone with the gift of exhortation, but they are a joy to be around, right? And um, we're, we're going we're gonna, to um, we're gonna make an announcement about exhortation and joy here shortly. But um, somebody with the gift of exhortation is always building you up, right? You walk away from conversations with them, and you just feel like a million bucks, so, um, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, compassion, and cheerfulness. And now, in verse 9, he says, let love be genuine. Um, the Greek word there is anhypocrites. It's where we get the word hypocrite, but it has the prefix an, meaning not. So, he says, don't be a hypocrite. He says, let love be genuine. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. What, mutual affection, that almost sounds like what? That almost sounds like the relationship between the Father and the Son in the communion of the Holy Spirit. It almost sounds like Paul knows that we're created in the image of God to share in the life of God. Don't lag in zeal. Be ardent spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Persevere in prayer. I asked someone to pray for me one time, and they did. And then I didn't really feel like anything changed. And I went back to that person, and they were offended. They were upset with me. I prayed for you one time. Okay, so I just went away. I didn't know. I was a kid. I was a young guy. Well, now I know. No, you're supposed to persevere in prayer. And I don't have an answer for why. You know, I can speculate. You know, it's like, I don't think there's a formula. You know, like God rolls a dice. He's got a decahedral dice up there like he had when you played uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And he rolls the dice and he says, ooh, eight. I'm going to wait for eight times. See, Bill prays eight times and I'm going to whatever. I don't think it's that. I don't know what it is. I just know that we're supposed to persevere in prayer. Bless those. He said, oh, wait. Um, 
Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with Weep with those who weep. That almost sounds like John eleven thirty seven, doesn't it? Live in harmony with one another. Do not, I wish harmony was here today. That would be great. Don't be haughty. Associate with the lowly. Don't claim to be wiser than you are. Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought, no, take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. And that word for wrath there is not what we think. It's not the word that means I'm really angry and I'm going to smite you. Paul wouldn't do that. See, here's the thing. If I say I'm a pacifist, like to the core, like way a pacifist, like I don't believe in violence at all, for any reason ever, right? No matter what's going on, there's a guy outside with an axe and he's trying to, you know, chop the bricks out from under my house so my house will fall down and crumble. Well, I'm, I might not go outside and, you know, throw rocks at him. What, what could I do in a case like that? He said, well, you could call the police. No, you can't. Because all you've done then is outsource your violence. So we got to use our brains, right? In so much, he says, never avenge yourselves, leave room for the wrath of God. So if God's wrath is what we sometimes think it is, then all we're doing is outsourcing our anger and wrath. The word here is orge. And it, it, yeah, it means wrath, but it means wrath fueled by love. When he says, don't repay evil for evil, leave room for the wrath of God, he's saying God doesn't repay evil for evil. God knows how to break in from the inside. I was sitting across from somebody one time who had tried to kill themselves four or five time, different ways in the same day. And this person was tied down like an animal with a trach tube unable to talk and, and hoses and wires and tubes connected and just pitiful, most pitiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And I was fairly new as a pastor. I didn't know what to say. How do you break through in that? The blessing was that I had just entered into a mentoring relationship with Baxter Kruger. And I had just come to understand the most crucial thing. So how do you break through? Well, you don't have to worry about that. It's already happened. I got a man on the inside. His name is Jesus. I don't have to break through because Jesus already has. And I will make my appeal from the inside of that person in Jesus Christ. So, not avenging ourselves and leaving room for the wrath of God doesn't mean that we, we you know, do you know what Schadenfreude is? Schadenfreude is this German term that's been sort of Americanized. I mean, I got some strange looks just now. Um, Schadenfreude literally translates dark joy. It's, it's the practice of taking pleasure in another's misfortune, right? Like, I'll give you an example of Schadenfreude. I'm driving along, and this car blows past me and almost takes my front bumper off, and then two minutes later, they're pulled over on the side of the road, and what do you do? Ha! They got him. That's Schadenfreude. Right? That shat, now, I won't say that's misfortune. Um, maybe, maybe that's a blessing for that person. You know, that, 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 that ticket that they got might, might have saved their life or someone else's. Who knows? Um, I just want you to know that, that the wrath of God is not an annihilation. It's not a retributive wrath. It's always restorative. And he says... Um, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, the, uh, says the Lord. And how does he say, if, if he says, hey, we're not supposed to repay evil for you, but God can? Is there evil in God? Is there, ever, is there ever a God acting behind the back of the real God? Is there an evil God that the good God says, all right, you're on. Um, this, is out of, this is above my pay grade or below it. 
get them. No, of course not. The, way, um, the, way, the, the theological way to say it is this. There's no ontological trinity behind the back of the economic trinity. Right? There's no economic trinity behind the back of the ontological trinity. There's no God doing anything other than the God who really is. So no, he says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. So he just told you to let, let God handle this stuff, and then he tells you what that looks like. How does God deal with his enemies? Tactical nukes, right? That way there's less collateral damage. No, he, if they're hungry, he feeds them. If they're thirsty, he gives them something to drink. By doing this, you will heap burning coals of fire on their head. And so now you've heard it, you've heard it preached this way. Yeah, because then they're going to feel really guilty and bad. Right? Maybe even like Judas, and they'll go throw themselves off a cliff or hang themselves. Yeah. Is that? He just said, he just said not to repay evil for evil, not to take vengeance. So heaping coals of fire can't mean that. But there were two practices during the time this was written. One was to put ashes on your head in a pot as a symbol of repentance. And the other was to transport fire, right? If your fire went out, that was a big deal. They didn't have, you know, uh, blue diamond matches, I'm sorry, or whatever, the, 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 is it red diamond? You know, the strike anywhere matches, they didn't have them. They didn't have Zippo lighters. It was a process and sometimes a, a difficult process to get a fire started. So if your fire went out, you'd go to your neighbor with this special clay pot that had a really thick bottom so it didn't burn you when you carried it, and they'd give you some coals from their fire, and you could go home and start your fire again. Right? If somebody is mistreating you, that fire's gone out. You help them start it back up. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Because I'll just tell you, a lot of times I'm just trying to be a peacekeeper. Right? Don't start nothing, won't be nothing. I just, I don't want to make trouble. You know, something's going down and I just want to get away. I don't, you know. Jesus says, if you want to hear Papa say, at a boy, or at a girl, one way is to be a peacemaker. Right? So we're in a situation where there's no peace. We can, we can work to make peace. Right? So I, um, I want to read this to you. I rewrote Romans 12, 9 through 21. Um, and I got some help. Um, my friend, he's also um, my professor that's supervising my doctoral work right now. His name is Dr. Matt Pandel. And uh, I emailed him and told him what I was up to and asked him for his input. And uh, the part at the end about the beer, that's, that's his contribution, I want you to know. So I rewrote Romans 12, verses 9 through 21, as it would have been written to an American political advisor in 2024. Because in no other arena is there more mean-spirited rhetoric and a lack of peace than in the election process that we have in this country. It is absolutely indecent. Right? So I asked myself a question recently because I was really upset. Really upset at, at the rhetoric. And then I just had an epiphany. I said, well, if, if the process itself is indecent, how could I be angry at someone that comes along that can exist in that process who acts indecently? Your stopped up septic tank is a mess. Are you mad that the plumber is dirty? Can't be. The only people that can fix the stopped up septic tank are the people that are willing to get dirty. Our election system in this country is a septic tank. It just is. So I rewrote it. So Romans 12, 9, as written to a campaign advisor in the United States of America in 2024. Let love appear to be genuine. Pretend to hate what is evil. Hold loosely to what is good because the good die young. Love one another as long as they love you first. 
and outdo one another in showing honor if there's something in it for you. Do not lag in zeal for your own self-interest. Be weak in spirit. Reject the Lord. Rejoice in the misfortune of others. Cause people suffering. Reject prayer. Dismiss the needs of the saints. When obligated to appear hospitable, either do so on another's dime or only, if no other recourse exists, ensure it's tax deductible. Persecute those who might persecute you first. Curse them. Be jealous of those who rejoice. Mock those who weep. Foment discord with others. Be haughty. You're better than them after all. Don't associate with the lowly. Just say you care. That's enough. Always claim to be wiser than you are. Repay evil for evil. Fight fire with fire. Take no thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Nice guys finish last. If it's possible, so far it depends on you, create chaos. Beloved, put no faith in God's redeeming justice. And this is uh, Dr. Matt's contribution to Doing so may result in him playing the mercy card. Rather, avenge yourselves, for it is written, don't get angry, get even. No, if your enemies are hungry, too bad for them. If they're thirsty, charge them for water and fill it with chemicals if possible. Eliminate coals of fire. Coal is bad for the environment. The only way to beat evil is to look it square in the eye, laugh in derision, and proclaim boldly. You call that evil? Hold my beer. <laughs> but this is not what we're called to. That's absurd, isn't it? But you would think, you would think this is the mandate for how campaign advisors work. Who told you to say that? I mean, somebody had to tell you, you know, who, who gave you that advice? We are called to be peacemakers. We're called to be peacemakers. And the system by which we vet candidates, I don't know about you, but I remember, I'm, I'm old enough to remember debates that were lively debates, but they were respectable respectable. And, you know, there was always, um, you know, maybe, maybe some quick wit, some, some intelligent sarcasm, stuff like that. But it, it wasn't mean-spirited. It wasn't name-calling, you know, the ad hominem attacks. Socrates said that ad hominem, and that's just Latin for personal attacks, like attacks against a person. Uh, he said that's the last desperate measure of those who cannot win in the arena of ideas. I remember when candidates would stand up and they believed in their message. They believed in their ideals and they thoroughly believed that if properly explained, their ideas would carry the day. That a majority of Americans would vote for them based on what they either had done or are saying they want to do. Not based on how, they, how good they are at running down the other guy. That's not, that's not who we are. We're God's children. We can do better. We can do better than that. And um, I did an episode of The Good Dirt um, on, this very, on this very matter. And um, in it, I said um, that I was going to take the advice of the king of pop. Starting with the man in the mirror, right? That's we can all do that. I mean, I I cannot um, I cannot imagine that any of us here has access to any political campaign. Whether I mean, all the way down to your local sheriff, access to the campaign advisors to say, yeah, well, we want to we want to be peace. Remember, we're we're to be peacemakers. But I can start with the man in the mirror. I mean, the Holy Spirit doesn't call me to violence and trouble and chaos and, you know, mean-mouthing everybody. We, we can be peacemakers in, in small areas that make a huge difference for people. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm better than everybody else because I have my moments too, Right? 
I have my moments when I'm not that good at being a peacemaker. Uh, you know, I summed up probably my childhood would be called troublemaker, not peacemaker. But we're called to be peacemakers, and it doesn't mean that when we blow it, we have to give up, right? If at first you don't succeed, right? Maybe I didn't get it right today, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about that. And I'm going to say, Holy Spirit, I want to get it right next time. Next time that happens, I'm going to get that right. And see, I filmed my uh, episode, Blessed Are the Peacemakers, um, the episode of The Good Dirt. I filmed it and um, got it edited and everything Thursday. And um, Friday, I was out driving somewhere, and this person almost killed me, it felt like. Because they were playing with their phone and blew through a red light. And I had to stop so I didn't get T-boned. And fortunately, it would have been on the passenger side, but that's where my golf clubs were. <laughs> I mean, I'm just getting where I can hit my long irons again, you know, after rebuilding my swing. I'm kidding, you know. It, and for a second, I was ready to scream and yell. I mean, it was that fast. And then I just heard this voice, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I know I am God's child, but I want to hear it. I want to hear that attaboy. Don't you? I do. I mean, I don't want to throw you back on yourselves. Making God the Father proud of us doesn't make us his children. But his his pride in me, and his pride in me, there's a level of his pride in me that's just ontological, right? An example that I always use is when my, when, my, when my elder daughter was in kindergarten, she got her first report card, first report card she ever got, and it was perfect. I mean, as, as perfect as it could be. It wasn't A's. They were all A pluses. And the citizenship grade, you know, was supposed to be satisfactory, Right? It was an S plus. And I remember holding it in my hand and I looked at Davina and I said, I've never held one of these before. And she goes, a report card? I said, no. A perfect report card. Never held one in my life. And I was so proud of her. But see, there, was, there were two other kids in that classroom that had perfect report cards just like hers and I wasn't proud of them. You know Why? Because they weren't mine. That little girl with the banana curls right there and the beautiful smile and the freckles, I'm proud of her because she's mine. See, my pride didn't have its origin in her report card or her performance. My pride had its origin in the fact that she was mine and God's pride in you doesn't have its origin in your performance either. It's because you're His. You belong to the Father, Son, and Spirit. You always have. You always will. The Father loves you and He likes you. You are His beloved child. So be His child. We're going to celebrate the common union that we have in Jesus Christ as we take communion together. So let's, uh, let's pass the elements and we'll pray as we do. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> Father in heaven, you've given us your son. You've given us your son. How could we think in giving us your son you would withhold anything else from us? You gave us the best thing you had. And we beg you for bread. We beg you for the rent money. Holy Spirit, deliver us from our insane ways of thinking and deliver us from mean-spiritedness. Help us to see value. Help us to see value in others.
in everyone. They are of exceptional, unspeakable value because they belong to you. Help us not esteem ourselves better than others. Because you certainly, Lord Jesus, did not esteem yourself better than us. Had you done that, you would not have gone to the cross of Calvary on our behalf. So as we take this bread, symbolizing your body, we ask you to meet us in it in a way that we can feel in our souls. And as we take this wine, representing the blood of the covenant, I pray, Lord, that thoughts of peace and reconciliation would permeate us from head to toe. In Jesus' name. Well, if you'd like to um, share in how we keep the lights on around here and all of that, um, you can do that by texting a gift to 804-409-0445. Or you can visit our website, I think. There's a link there, gchanover.org. And, of course, you can can come in person and uh, sign over the deed to your house right here in the room with us. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We don't, we don't have any, uh, any uh, real estate lawyers. We couldn't do anything with that anyway. Um, <laughs> bless you. Bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.